Thanks for the introduction. So uh, I can get started. Yeah. Um, hi everyone, uh, I'm Kai Yu and a postdoc at Caltech. I uh, work on using machine learning to improve theorems and proof assistance, such as clock and link. So today I'm really excited to introduce the, you to this emerging and very exciting area. Uh, I will present a broad overview of work in this domain, including but not limited to my work. Um, and since many of you are mathematicians, I will try to explain the necessary background in machine learning. And fin finally, I will discuss some ongoing and future efforts for integrating machine learning models into the workflow of link users. Um, cool. So before um, before diving into machine learning, uh, let's start with like computer aided proofs in general. Well, at least a part of the proof is carried out by computers. And they have been around for many decades, starting from probably the famous four color theorem, where the computer was used to check more than 1000 configurations. And since then, computer aided proofs have been found in many areas of mathematics, not limited to discrete mathematics. For example, a recent breakthrough in PDE used computers to help find a blow up of the Euler equation. And in, in this work, uh, mathematicians, they use computers to numerically calculate the bounds of, uh, uh, the bounds of an integral. Um, and these two problems come from very different mass domain and the computer programs in these problems are probably tailored to each problem. Um, however, they have one thing in common, that is mathematicians still have to do a lot of work. And computers are only responsible for certain calculations in the proof. And so that you can think of them as a fancier calculator that mathematicians use when proving these two theorems. So on the other extreme, can we just state the theorem and ask computers to find the proof automatically without any intervention from us? And this is called automated theorem proving and is a topic of great interest in both computer science and uh, AI. And here is a simplified view of a traditional automated theorem prover. Say we want to prove a theorem about the sum of n integers. The prover represents mathematics in a very low level language, typically first order logic. So first, it converts the negation of the theorem into a list of formulas called conjunctive normal form. Um, here, I only show two formulas in this list, but in general, this list can be very, very long. And then at each step, it performs an operation called resolution, which selects two formulas in the list and generate a new formula and add to the list. So it performs resolution repeatedly until at some point it gets a special formula. At this point, the theorem has been proved. So the main challenge with this approach is that the search space is just too large because the list is very big. So at each step, it has many ways to perform the resolution and the entire proof consists of a large number of steps. And there is a large body of work trying to uh, prune the search space using various heuristics. Uh, and we have seen some successful stories. For example, in 1997, the Robbins conjecture in algebra um, was first proved by an automated prover before any human can prove it. However, uh, in general, this approach is very difficult to scale for most interesting theorems in mathematics. And this is kind of expected because otherwise mathematicians don't have to prove theorems anymore. They just state the theorem, push a button, and then the proof comes out. This is just too good to be true. So in my opinion, um, the greatest lesson we learn from automated theorem proving is the importance of high level math intuition. Um, because if you ask humans to prove this theorem, th they will just use induction. Um, however, induction is a high level proof strategy that does not simply correspond to a sequence of resolutions in this uh, setup. Also, this kind of automated prover do not allow mathematicians to guide the proof search using their math knowledge and intuitions. 
So here is where proof assistants like Lin can help. And in Lin, starting from the theorem as the original goal, humans prove the theorem by interacting with Lin through tactics. So each tactic transforms the current goal and possibly decomposes it into uh, simpler sub goals. And this process is repeated uh, until all goals are solved. Here, goals and tactics are high level enough to be understood by humans. And the guidance from human mathematicians is critical to finding the proof. Um, although the lack of automation is uh, sometimes a problem, it makes theorem proving in Lean a kind of laborious task. Uh, however, there are huge opportunities to make it more automatic. So this is an active area of research and machine learning represents one promising approach to automating the interaction with proof assistants. And what makes machine learning promising is that it seems to already understand a lot, a lot of mathematics. Um, here we focus the discussion on a class of models widely successful in machine learning. Uh, large language models, or LLMs. GPT-4 is one example of LLM. Uh, it has performed exceptionally well in standard exams. For example, in SAT math, it has achieved the 89th percentile among human test takers. And another example is Google's Minerva model. Um, so given this inequality to uh, in Minerva, uh, the model can produce a very reasonable proof. So LRMs can also be useful for more advanced mathematics. In this June, Terence Tao posted his experience uh, ex interacting with GPT-4, and he believes models like GPT-4 can potentially be collaborators um, that offer suggestions to mathematicians. And a recent study from Cambridge uh, investigates how LLMs can help us prove uh, undergrad level mathematics. So given these results, um, there are still controversies regarding whether the model truly understands mathematics or whether it just memorizes the correlation in the data set. Or what does it mean to understand mathematics? But putting this uh, all these philosophical debates aside, we still have reasons to believe um, that mathematical knowledge in LLMs can potentially be useful for guiding interaction theorem proofs, such as Lin. And before discussing large language models for theorem proving, I want to give a very simplified and high level overview of what they actually are. Um, you can basically think of LLMs as mappings between strings. It takes an input string X and maps it to an output string Y, which is usually produced by predicting the next word autoregressively. And it is not a fixed mapping, uh, but a family of mappings parameterized by a very high dimensional continuous vector, theta. We will not talk much about uh, what, what this mapping is. For most large language models like GPT-4, it is a kind of neural network called transformer, but the detail of how transformer works is not important for this talk. And um, large language models are trained on data sets to learn these parameters data. Initially, theta is random, and the behavior of this mapping is also quite random, for example, if you feed how are you as input, it will just, uh, sorry? Okay, it may just output some random characters. Then uh, we pre train the model to, on a massive data set of text, for example, the text from the entire internet. Uh, and the training objective is very simple. Given a partial sentence, the model should predict the missing part. So after pre-training, the model becomes very good at completing a passage. If you give it how you as input, th this is a possible completion. Actually, this is a real example from an old version of GPT-3. 
And presumably the model has learned a lot from like emails and messages from people looking for jobs. Um, okay, so this is for completing a passage, but passage completion may be very useful in certain contexts, but it's not a natural way for humans to communicate. So more recent large language models like GPT-4 has an additional step called alignment. Roughly speaking, they ask humans to provide feedback on the model's output, and then they further train the model to align its behavior to the human feedback. And after alignment, the model becomes more like a real human that you can talk to. Um, if you say, how are you? A typical GPT-4 answer would be, hello, I don't have any feeling, but I'm able to help you. How can I help you today? And um, so this alignment step is also um, where a lot of work on AI ethics comes in. Um, we want the model's output to be harmless. For example, in many scenarios, the model should make it very clear that it is not a human. And that's why here it says, I don't have any feeling, instead of like, uh, I'm really good, how are you doing? And pre-training followed by alignment, uh, this pipeline is the workhorse behind state-of-the-art large language models, such as GPT-4, Clouder, and BART. And it seems very simple, um, at least conceptually, but each of these systems takes incredible amount of work to build. And there are also alternatives from the open source community, uh, although open source large language models are believed to be less performant um, as of today. And after the model has been trained, there are two main ways of using it. Um, first, you can simply add instructions to the input. For example, you can ask GPT-4 to classify the sentiment in a product review as positive or negative. So this way of using large language model is called prompting because you give the model a prompt. So prompting does not require changing the model parameter and is currently the only way to interact with state-of-the-art commercial models such as GPT-4. Alternatively, if you have a data set of many product reviews and their sentiment, you can further train the model to become specialized in this very, very narrow task. And this is called fine tuning. After fine tuning, you simply give it a review and it should produce this label. So all large language model-based theorem prover in the rest of this talk are based on this fine-tuning paradigm. Next, I'm going to talk about large language models for theorem proving, um, but I, I want to note that uh, there are also other machine learning models for theorem proving before large language models, but we will not talk about these methods in this talk. Um, first, uh, a general uh, useful task for large language models is to generate tactics. So given the proof goal as input, for example, here you are asked to prove a statement about the greatest common divisor, you give the goal as input, and you want the model to predict the next tactic. So this, you, you can imagine this could be very useful if uh, the model can give you suggestions when you use link. Um, so this model is trained following at least three steps. Um, so first you take, you pre-train the model on, uh, on generic text from the internet. I mean, you, you can either pre-train it by yourself or you can take a, a existing pre-trained model um, that, that's open sourced. And usually people build on existing models. And optionally, you can further train the model on domain specific text. For example, text related to mathematics uh, from Math Overflow, or text related to coding from GitHub. And uh, finally, you fine tune the model on the Go tactic pairs from former math libraries, uh, for example, AFP for Isabel or MathLib for Link. So this is the steps for training, and 
after the model is trained, you want to evaluate the model. You want to know how good it is. So you want to know, uh, you want to use this model to generate proofs, not only, not just tactics. So what people usually do is um, you sample multiple tactics from, from each, at each step. So given a proof goal, you ask the model to provide like 10 tactics or 20 tactics. And then you, you use these tactics as candidates, you search for a proof. And then you can evaluate on, um, on the percentage of theorems you can prove uh, for uh, on a particular data set, for example, on MathLib, and on the fixed computational budget. For example, you can give the model like 10 minutes. So this paradigm is first pioneered by this work, uh, Generative Language Modeling for Automated Theorem Proving, and this is from OpenAI. So this is just a general framework. So next I'm going to go over uh, a number of papers, each trying to build on this framework and uh, uh, add something uh, onto this framework. So the first one is this uh, proof artifact co-training paper. So it, it's also from OpenAI. Um, so the idea is, um, because large language models are very data hungry, you need a lot of data, but uh, we, human written proofs are very limited because currently we have around 100,000 proofs in MathLib. Um, I believe for Isabel, it's, uh, it has uh, more proofs, but it's on the same order of magnitude on the maybe two or 300,000. Um, so, so th we have a modest amount of proof data, but it's not enough for large language models. Um, so what they do in this paper is they propose a number of uh, auxiliary tasks. For example, they have next lemma prediction where you given a proof goal, you predict the next lemma, and you have this theorem naming where you give a give it a theorem statement, you ask the model to to name the theorem. So they have nine auxiliary tasks, and their key insight is. Uh, if you train the model on tactic prediction plus the auxiliary tasks, it is better than training on tactic prediction alone. So this is the result. Uh, if you compare the final line, uh, the 48.4 here, with the baseline that's only on tactic, uh, pre pre tactic generation, like 32.2. Uh, so th this improvement is from uh, the auxiliary tasks. Okay, so this is this proof artifact code training. And the next one is a benchmark called mini F2F. So it's a data set paper. It doesn't produce a method, but it produces a data set. So it, this data set focuses on uh, math Olympias problems. They, they mainly come from AMC, AME, or IMO. Um, so I believe AMC is some like American mathematics comp competition, some, some kind of thing, yeah. Uh, and in this data set, they have uh, 488 theorems. Um, not that they are just theorems because many of them don't have proofs uh, and they are for evaluation. So they are, they are not for training because you, the, the data set is too small for training. It's not going to work if you have only a few hundred training theorems. Um, and uh, so this for evaluation, this is a widely used data set uh, and we, it also points to two open problems uh, of creating benchmarks. Uh, first is, um, how do we formalize a problem if it asks for a numerical answer? Um, for example, here is a problem. Uh, I think this problem is already transformed, but the original problem should be, uh, you, you should solve for A, that, that A satisfies this equation. But, but you don't know the answer before you're solving it. Uh, but uh, if you want to formalize in Lean as a theorem, what they have done is they, they first calculate the answer and th then they, they make it a theorem. Like uh, you, you, you want, the theorem is you want to prove A equals to eight. Uh, but, but as you can see, this is actually simpler than the original question because in the original question, you have to derive the answer by yourself. Um, but that, that's an uh, open question and we don't know how to handle these kind of uh, theorems. And another open question is, um, how do we deal with geometry? Um, because in IMO and in other math competition problems, um, a, a large part is 
uh, 2D geometry or uh, maybe 3D geometry. Um, but it's, it's not clear how do we even formalize geometry, uh, I mean, uh, elementary Euclidean geometry in Lean. Okay, so the next paper uh, is this called uh, Formal Mathematics Statement Curriculum Learning. It's also from OpenAI. Uh, and OpenAI has a blog called uh, Solving Some Formal Math Olympia Problems. Um, so the motivation is that often we have a very specialized domain uh, that we care, and we don't have a lot of proofs for training. So this is the case for mini F2F. Because mini F2F, uh, they, they, it's a very small data set, they don't have training proofs, and it's a very specialized domain, like uh, Olympia problem. So if you train the model on MathLib, and you use the model directly on, on mini F2F, it's not going to work very well. Because uh, machine learning uh, and large language models, they perform usually very bad um, if the testing domain is very different from the training domain. So what they did, what they have done, the solution uh, is try to iteratively improve the prover on, on this new domain. So, th so they have st three steps. Um, so first they train a prover and then they use the prover to find new proofs, to prove theorems. Um, so in this process, you will get some new proofs that you, you haven't seen before. So the third step is you add these new proofs back to the training data. So now your training data is augmented with these new proofs from this new domain, and you go back to step one. So you iterate, uh, you hopefully can further into, uh, improve the performance. So this is the result. Um, uh, I believe if you compare uh, the, this, this text, these numbers in bold, uh, to to this line to to this theta theta zero. So we compare theta zero to theta one, and theta one has a higher number, which uh, which is the improvement. Um, okay, then we move to the next one. So this uh, Lindojo theorem proving paper is is from our group. Um, so what what we done is uh, we note that. A learning based theorem prover, I mean, in Lean or in any proof assistant, it's a very complex system. Uh, so, here is the overall pipeline. First, you need to extract a data set from Lean. So, you get a, your training data set. And then, you, after you have this data set, you can train the model. And after you have this model, you, uh, you, you need some tool for the model to interact with Lean uh, programmatically. So you need tools for data extraction, you need tool for interaction, and you need the model and the data set. You need a lot of things here. Um, and one barrier in, in the research uh, on large language models for theory improving um, is that we, we don't really have a lot of open source options. So this is a list of all large language model for theory improving paper that I'm aware of. Um, many of them are very hard to reproduce and uh, with a reasonable amount of effort because first they they use private data sets. So here a, a check mark means the data set is available and a cross mark means it's not available. Um, and second, they uh, for all of this existing work, uh, they haven't released the model and they, don't, they haven't released the code base for training and evaluating the model. And third, uh, theorem proving, as we said, it requires a tool for the model to interact with the proof assistant. But very few existing work has released this tool. And finally, the compute requirement in prior work ranges from 1K GPU hour to 48 GPU hours which is quite exclusive to industry labs with a lot of resources. Um, I just want to fix an error here. Um, I believe for the interaction tool availability, uh, the work from Albert Young, the, it, it should actually, it, so they are already available. So they recently released this tool. Um, so this is a error in the, on the Slack. 
And um, so it is a bit unfortunate that although this area has been around for a few years and there are, but there is surprisingly very little for, for people to play with or to build up because everything's private and they cannot be reproduced and you cannot compare to them because what, what you can access is the numbers in their paper. But if you write your own paper, your experimental setting might be a little bit different from existing papers and there's no way to compare. Um, so I see this as one of the most important barriers in large language models for theory proving. So one contribution of our Lindojo is that uh, we want to break this barrier and uh, by providing tools, data sets, and the models that are completely open sourced. Um, and our model is very inexpensive. It needs only 180 hours to train, so, so less than one week to train on a single GPU. Um, we have our, so thereby we, uh, we give researchers access to state-of-the-art large language model-based provers with uh, small computational costs. And we, are, we have already open sourced uh, our work, so you are welcome to check it out. So this is our contribution to open source research. And another part of our contribution is this model called retrieval augmented model. So existing models for theorem, large language models for theorem proving, uh, it takes the proof state as input and outputs the tactic. But it does not, the model has, has no knowledge of what existing lemmas and definitions or other premises you can use. So in other words, it cannot do premise selection, at least explicitly. Um, the model can memorize the name of premises during training, uh, but that is not efficient. And also, if your testing data is very different from the training data, if the name names are very different, then it's not going to work. So that's why we introduced a new model called retrieval augmented model. What we do is given a state, a proof goal, uh, we first, we, we, we compile a list of premises in the in MathLib that's accessible to, to this state, which, which means it has been imported to the current file. Um, on average, there are 33,000 um, available premises and we want to use this state as the query to retrieve relevant premises. So what, what we do is we, we convert, we embed the state as a vector and we embed each vector or each premise as a vector. So we have a lot of vectors here. And we calculate the cosine similarity between the state and all premises. So we have a bunch of numbers, the cosine similarities, and then we find the premises with the maximum cosine similarity. So these are the retrieved premises that we believe are relevant to this proof. Um, and after that, we combine the state with the premises and we use that as the basis for, for generating the tactic. So in this way, the model can explicitly consider what, what premises are available and what premises it can use to, to prove this theory. So, okay, that's the retrieval augmented prover. And next I want to show a simple demo. Um, so this demo is not, it's not our model, it's, is GPT-4, OpenAI's GPT-4. Um, and we use Lindojo to enable GPT-4 to interact with Lin. Um, and the GPT-4 is free to execute tactics and get, uh, get feedback from Lin. So, so we just tell GPT-4, uh, I want to prove a theorem. We give it a theorem name and a file name, and it will call Lindojo to initialize the theorem. Yeah. And then you get the initial proof state. So this is the proof state. And GPT-4 is trying to make sense of the proof state. So it will say something in, in natural language, in math. And it will try to lay out a high level plan for, for the proof. So this is just a toy theorem, by the way. Then it will start to execute tactics. 
So first is try a rewrite tactic and get another state. So it tries to make sense of this new state and another tactic. And the final tactic. So now the dojo returns proof finish equals to true. So GPT-4 knows the theorem has been proved. And I can ask GPT-4 to, to write down the proof. Can you show me the final proof you found? So this is the, the theorem and the proof uh, discovered by GPT-4. Okay, so uh, right now this is very preliminary because if you try any non-trivial theorem, it's not going to work. It's, it's going to stuck some well, try this tactic failed, try that tactic failed. Uh, but I believe the, uh, in the future, we still have a lot of room to improve here. And uh, so here is another uh, peripheral work related to theorem proving. Um, so this task is called auto-formalization. So in, in this in auto formalization, we don't want to prove theorems. What we want is, given a natural language theorem, uh, can we translate it into uh, into a formal version? For example, in Lean. So we want to use large language models to translate informal to formal. Uh, you can see this is a very useful task because if you can do that reliably, you can apply it to all existing math papers and math textbook, and you get a lot of formalized Lean theorems and proofs. Um, so that would be really useful, but uh, this task is less well-defined compared to theorem proving. Uh, we don't really know what, what the correct task setup is. And uh, another question is, it's very difficult to evaluate. Because imagine you have a theorem, you, you have a theorem on the textbook, and your system gives you a auto-formalized theorem in Lean. Um, how do you know th this? This link theorem is actually the same as the as the original theorem. Um, I mean, there is no good way, uh, be, unless you try you try to look at the theorems manually and check. So these are two examples of their input and output. Um, I believe they are using Isabel in, instead of link. So that's auto formalization. And so this is another work. Uh, the final work I'm going to talk about um, is from Albert Young. Um, so it's the idea is we, we large language models like GPT-4, they know a lot of math, but but they are informal math. How can we uh, use this informal math knowledge to guide a formal proof? Uh, so what they do is uh, so so first you have a you have a th statement, theorem statement in natural language. Um, like you, you know the GCD and the LCM between two numbers and you want to show n equals to seven. So the first step is draft. Uh, so you uh, you draft an informal proof. So given a formal th informal theorem, you, you generate an informal proof. Uh, you can do that manually uh, using humans, or you can use machine learning. Um, but assume you have this informal proof. How can you use it to imp to get a formal proof? So the second step is called sketch. Uh, instead of translating the informal proof to formal proof directly, they translate it into something they call a formal proof sketch. So a proof sketch is a proof with holes. So it's not a complete proof. You have three holes here. Um, because but, but in this way, uh, it corresponds more directly to the informal proof. Inform, since informal proofs always have a lot of holes uh, from the standard of Ling. Uh, and the third step, after you have this sketch, the third step is proof where they just call a hammer to fill those gaps. And this is also on Isabel because in Lean we don't have a very good hammer yet. But in principle, this could also be applicable to Lean. Um, so I think this is a really good work. And 
So that's that concludes the part about prior work on uh, in this domain. And finally, the the final part of this talk, I want to talk about uh, how can we use machine learning and large language models to to build proof automation tools for Lean. So uh, in general, we want to build a bridge between Lean and machine learning. And uh, up to now, I've been talking about this direction of the bridge. Like, how can we make Lean accessible to machine learning? How can machine learning researchers work on theory improving? Um, so by, by doing so, I mean, machine learning researchers, they, uh, they train, they grab a data set, they train a model, and they evaluate the model on, the, on their GPU server. They, they, uh, they don't really use it to, in, in VS Code. So that's their way of uh, their pipeline of doing research, but which is different from uh, what Lean users need. Uh, so we really want to also build the other direction of this bridge. That is, how can we have learning-based proof automation tools for the Lean users? Um, we find Lean users have uh, a few tells about uh, different things compared to machine learning researchers. So first, they they want the tool to run on CPUs and and reasonably fast. Because they they don't want to connect to a GPU server every time you use Lean, and also they don't want to wait for like 24 hours before seeing whether it can prove the theorem. Um, and also, the tool has to be integrated into VS Code so they can use it in VS Code directly. And third, um, many Lean users they care about a specific domain, like if they work on their specific project in Lean. They want they want to have a tool that works for their project, uh, and they don't necessarily care the care about the aggregated performance of this tool on Netflix. So uh, I want to briefly survey a few existing work in this area, but they are all very preliminary because this is a very new area. Uh, so first, we have this tool for tactic suggestion. So this is the co tool called. LLM staff is from uh, like from Sean and Saha. Uh, so in in this VS Code interface, you you type the LLM step tactic, and here you get tactic suggestions. So uh, on the bottom you get suggestions from this model. And so what they do is that they just take the data set from Lean Dojo, and they train a model on this data set for tactic suggestion. And they uh, in Lean they make remote calls to this model and they displace the result in the info view panel. Uh, so it's already open sourced. Uh, I encourage you to check it out. And so that's tactic suggestion. Second, we another problem in Lean is we want to do premise selection. This is also very important problems. We already have building tactics such as library research uh, in link three or apply and exact in link four. So these tactics do some kind of uh, library search in a very rigid way, but we also have machine learning based methods. So this work, uh, it is also open source. It's a, uh, it uses a machine learning model to select tactics. So if you type suggest premises, uh, in, in this proof. So it will uh, pick some premises and show you on the info in the info panel here. Um, so that's premise selection. And finally, have some tools for Lean to interact with, with GPT-4 or ChatGPT. So this is a tool called Segreto. Uh, they have, they, they, it's not open source yet, I believe. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but they have released a demo on YouTube. Uh, so what they do is they, if you type a tactic, Segreto here, uh, on the info panel, you will see some conversation between Ling and uh, ChatGPT. And you can ask ChatGPT to give, give you a proof. Uh, cool, I think that, concludes my talk and thank you. Yeah, so thank you very much. We're gonna try to take questions from the audience. I, uh, I hope this works. Um, who would like to ask a question? 
So I, I'll just try to move the microphone around the room to get to the speaker. I mean, to get to the person who's asking the question. Sure, yeah. Uh, hi, Caillou. Uh, I was curious uh, whether you had compared um, the machine learning based uh, premise selection techniques to things like apply question mark and exact question mark and sort of what the strengths of either of them are. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, so I think the question is about this work. Um, so this work is not from us, so we didn't do a detailed comparison. Uh, but according to what I know about this work, um, a, the most important difference is, uh, for example, apply is very rigid. So you it can only solve the prime selection problem if uh, if the the lemma you apply matches with the goal in in some way uh, up to unification. So that unification has to succeed. Um, so that makes it very efficient for this specific class of prime selection problem, uh, but for machine learning models, it's applicable to a broad class of problems, although it's less reliable. Sometimes it just doesn't work. I think that's the main difference. Um, that, Any questions? Yeah, yeah. Um, you showed uh, this slide uh, showing all these uh, commercial models that uh, are not publicly available and also about the um, times that they need uh, training. So I was wondering how do you achieve it that you need less training times? I see. Uh, just to clarify, these are not commercial models. Um, these are, I mean, although most of them are from industry labs, they uh, they are still research papers. They they don't they are not products, uh, and uh, so the question is how why how can we be more computationally efficient than this work? Um, uh, I believe so, so. First, uh, there are a few reasons. First, our model is smaller. If you look at the model size here, our model is small is the smallest among or it's not the smallest, but it, it's very small compared to those very big ones. Um, and second, uh, as I mentioned in this work, uh, in this expert iteration work, so some people, they first train the prover and then they use the prover to uh, iteratively improve the, uh, the theorem, the theorem proving. Uh, so this, this, this step is very computationally expensive, this expert iter iteration step. And we don't perform expert iteration, we just train the model um, on human written proofs, and um, so that also saves uh, a lot of computation. Thank you. Um, so you also mentioned that as part of Lean Dojo, you use these cosine similarities by looking at the the tree basically, which lies behind a certain theorem or statement, and are these um, learned these similarities, or do you have a rigid scheme on how you compute them? Uh, it's known. So this pipeline, the figure here, only shows the inference. So what's happening during testing, and in training, uh, it we have a two-stage training pipeline. So first we train the retriever here, and then after the retriever is learned, we fix the retriever and learn the other part of the model. So the retriever part is learned. Yeah, and so you, because in our data set we have annotations of which theorem you, depends on which lemma, and we can use this data to to learn the model. You, you mentioned when we were dis discussing prior to you actually uh, presenting today um, that part of the Lean Dojo project was also setting up a framework where you could um, interact with Lean in a reinforcement learning setting. Um, are you planning to do more work in that direction or have people started working on actually using that framework? Uh, in, in the Lindona paper, we 
we have this tool for the model to interact with Lean. It can potentially be used for reinforcement learning, but we didn't perform any reinforcement learning in our paper. Um, I, I, I'm not aware of whether there are people trying reinforcement learning for this task. Um, so, but there are some related work. Um, for example, the expert iteration here, it, it's a very special form of reinforcement learning because you, you use the model to get new data. You use the model to collect, to interact with link and collect new data. So that's kind of like reinforcement learning. Um, but for other kind of reinforcement learning, I don't think there are very successful prior work. Um, one barrier is that um, if you add reinforcement learning to this pipeline, it's going to be much, much, much more computationally expensive. I personally wouldn't have I personally don't have access to the compute for pursuing this direction. Any more questions from the audience? Yes. Uh, so you talked about um, automatic uh, formalization, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, and you said that it's it's difficult to. Um, to see if, uh, if if the model is doing that, that right, right? So uh, yeah. has it ever been pro uh, been tried to do something like uh, you take a theorem or a lemma in MathLib, um, you have the informal statement for that lemma, uh, then you ask the theorem prover to formalize it, uh, and then to check if this formalization is correct, you just take out the lemma from MATLAB and see if like the depending lemmas broke down. Uh, I mean, you substitute the lemma with the formalized one by the model and you see if, if it works. W would it be possible to do it or has it ever been proved to do it this way? Um, I, I think the, because the uh, formalized theorem generated by the model, they could be equivalent to the correct one in some sense, like mathematically equivalent. So, uh, but it's very difficult to check whether they are equivalent. Um, so you, you cannot just check whether they are exactly the same. Okay, but I mean, if, um, if every lemma which depends on it still works, I mean, at least if it is a famous enough theorem, so if there are at, uh, enough uh, lemmas that depend on it, uh, if it still works, it should be, I mean, it's not, a guarantee that it's the same lemma, but it should be a pretty strong uh, evidence that it it is the same lemma, right? Um, yeah, but uh, I think that this criteria may, may be a little bit too strict because it's possible that the lemma is equivalent, it's but it's somehow different than, uh, it's different enough to break uh, the lemmas depending on it, but it's equivalent in some mathematical sense. I, I think that's pretty possible. I mean, given, I mean, when, when we migrate from link three to link four, uh, there are a lot of troubles. Like we, we want to have this small fix um, to, to make these things work. Um, I, I think th that tells us even if the theorem change a little bit um, to an equivalent theorem, it, it might break many things. Thank you. More questions? Ah, um, yes, one moment. I have to run a little bit here. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, on a previous slide, you had a table showing the metrics on mini F2F and MATLAB valid. I'm curious exactly what MATLAB valid is. Is it every proof anywhere in MATLAB? Is it every theorem in MATLAB? Is it every theorem proved in tactic mode in MATLAB? Um, I, so first, I believe this is a paper a few years ago. So it so it was published this year, but it it was on archive oh, okay. a few years ago. Okay. Um, so it's a uh, MathLib three, a very old version of MathLib three, um, and uh, it's uh, it's just for the theorems in, in that version of MathLib3, and they use it for as the validation set. Okay, so it's only the theorem the proof proofs, inside yeah. of the definitions. Yeah. Okay, thanks.
more questions? That seems not to be the case for now, at least. So I think we've yeah, reached the end of the talk and the end of the colloquium. Let us thank the final speaker again. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Yeah, so thanks a lot for joining us remotely. And it's a real pity you couldn't come due to visa issues. Um, yeah, yeah, I really hope I can come next year. Yeah, um, yeah did you hear that the organizer of the, the next uh, LFTCM, <laughs> he will come next year. OK, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye. The, the point of time to time to thank all speakers once more who've um, presented at the colloquium. And uh, yeah, thank you also to all the curious participants. I'm, <laughs> I hope you all had a, had a great time and you will leave at least as curious as you arrived. Um, yeah, I just have a, now just some very small administration announcement that I need to make. So for the speakers and tutors, please see me and hand in your reimbursement forms so we can reimburse you. For the participants, there were one or two participants who asked me for a certificate of attendance. Also, please just come and see me. I have the certificate here, but I won't find you if you don't find me. And um, finally, if you could just, when you leave, I mean, if you really, really want to, you can take your name tag with you, but it won't give you free food next week. <laughs> Alternatively, if you could just leave them at the door and we'll use it for the next conference, thank you.